so I just want to get this out of the way uh, first. So some young lady, um, some social justice warrior, TikToker, whatever, uh, decided to cancel Rome. Rome has in the Roman Empire. Um, yeah, and it's, it's amazing the lengths people will go to, uh, you know, to dismantle history. Needless to say, she was shut, uh, shut down pretty, pretty quickly. By other historians and whatnot and that was pretty entertaining um listen if science is something you believe more than anything else then you get archaeology that's how that works archaeologists rely on scientists things like carbon dating they could tell an artifact when it was created uh, who bled on it and you know make a timeline so these are real uh, facts these things happen and science is real, so there you go. Uh, anyway, um, this is part two of my little history rant here. Uh, my previous one I talked about uh, Byzantine and Roman auxiliaries, you know, the backup soldiers for the empires. And, um, you know, their purpose and their country of origins and all that stuff. So this is kind of like that. Uh, basically, um, patriots, expatriates that fight someone else's battle with permission or just kind of pack up and leave their country of origin to kind of assimilate into another territory and, you know, become favor favorable for uh, another particular military than their own uh, country of origin. Uh, for example, uh, this guy right here, uh, Giovanni Francesco Aldobrandini. Um, he was a soldier, a general for the uh, Papal State. And so imagine, like, okay, so your favorite team is, like, the uh, the Eagles, right? You're from Philly, Philadelphia Eagles, right? But you hate the, the Flyers, uh, the you know, Philly uh, hockey team. And you like, you know, the uh, the Penguins. You know, you, you know, you like another team, you know, that's not quite your own. But, you know, you still root for them where you're at, where you might go to that part of, you know, that state or whatever, uh, to root for them, even though you're not from that territory. So that that's kind of like what these guys did. You know, they were born in one spot, but, you know, they want to think twice about fighting someone else's battle, if it's for a common cause, usually. Uh, in this case, for this guy, um, Giovanni here, he, um, uh, you know, like I said, worked for the Pope, and the Pope kind of, um, kind of granted him uh, permission to uh, fight in this, uh, you know, war that the Hungarians actually were dealing with, uh, the Ottomans, you know, and this was, you know, late 1500s, almost 1600s, he actually passed away, 1601, um, but he was pretty um, formidable, he was a good general, and like I said, you know, working for the Papal Army, he led an Italian army into occupied territories, of the Kingdom of Hungary that were dealing with the Ottomans. And he won a lot. In fact, the only thing that really checked him was uh, fever that I believe he died of. And um, obviously he had to stop and start campaigns over and over again because of uh, sickness, you know, that was spread throughout the camp. The conditions back then weren't as uh, clean as they are today. So you know, it's uh, nothing out of the ordinary. But another guy here, um, another guy kind of uh, that was a reading up on, and uh, surprisingly not mentioned that much. Uh, so he was a expatriate, I could guess. He was born in Florence, um, you know, kind of a popular family. Um, he became a merchant, and I guess got the itch of being a soldier of fortune, and decided to move to Hungary. Um, his name is Papio Spano. Uh, his name is way, way bigger, but for you know, simplicity terms, I'll keep it like that. Um, what I do to look up these um, individuals is I'll use their country of origins, you know, Wikipedia or Britannica. For example, I'm using a Wikipedia page for this particular guy. Um, and uh, what I did is I looked under the Hungarian version of this and just, got, I feel like, you know, uh, the people, you know, respected this guy were probably Hungarian, so I would necessarily, you know, go to these Hungarian, you know, websites, translate them to English, and try to get their, their uh, perspective and history on this guy. 
because they would know the myth and the lore and all that stuff, the legend, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, this guy was pretty imp impressive. Like I said, um, a lot of battles. Um, what was interesting about him, like I said, you know, being an Italian, uh, his family was of somewhat importance, uh, became a merchant, and then uh, eventually made his way to uh, Hungary. Uh, married a noble woman there, got in favor with the king, uh, Sigmund, I believe, and actually became like really buddy buddy with them, trusting enough to be entitled to you know leading armies into battles. And from the sources here, he won a lot of those battles. Now, obviously, give it you know they were exaggerated. Obviously, when you read into history, you know take it with a grain of salt. And I would say you know dig a little deeper if you want to find out yourself. You know use other people's sources, other country sources, to get a roundabout um, structure, and then you go from there. Uh, he was actually part of the uh, Order of the Dragons. Now, if that sounds familiar, if you're a, a Vlad Dracula or Vlad the Impaler fan, this guy, you know, Vlad's dad and Vlad himself were part of this order. So, Order of the Dragons were like this knightly hood. Think of it that way, you know, like a, like a sir, like a knight, you know, and um, other people too, uh, different um, nationalities of Europe. Um, were part of this order too, but he was one of the founding members, it says, and uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, he actually, um, so uh, aside from obviously, obviously fighting, you know, the biggest kids in the block, which were the Ottomans, they were kind of like, you know, kicking ass and taking names. And um, the, the Kingdom of uh, Hungary, you know, they could, you know, at the time handle themselves. This was a little, you know, uh, earlier than the previous guy I was talking about. It's like, 1400s, late 14, you know, mid 1400s, um, and Hungary at the time could, you know, probably stand their own two feet, but, you know, they weren't fools. If they needed help, they would obviously ask for help. This guy being an outsider, but, you know, gaining such, you know, friendship and camaraderie with the Hungarians and the noble Hungarians, uh, like I said, he led armies and he won a lot of them. And not just there, so, according to this, this guy... It was all over the place, mostly Eastern Europe, Bosnia, Serbia. Now, whether or not he was fighting those people, you know, or because they were, I believe at the time, occupied, or at least under the influence of the Turks and the Ottomans, so, you know, he could have been fighting them in those, you know, uh, countries, uh, respectively. Uh, a lot of Bosnian campaigns I'm seeing. Uh, he fought the Czech Republic against, like, the Zealot group, the uh, Hussites, which were like these, like, you know, overbearing religious faction, you know, that kind of wanted to do their own thing, but people kind of pushed, so they pushed back harder. And that battle, he didn't win, you know. I'm seeing a lot of trouble with that uh, campaign. Um, the Venetians, actually. So at some point, he, in his career, he went back to Italy and uh, fought there, you know. I'm sure he, you know, uh, he visited uh, Florence. Uh, he had a little bit of business in Italy, uh, Bologna. Um, so uh, he was sent on a campaign to, I guess, like uh, rectify some religious favors for the Pope, you know, um, representing, uh, you know, the Kingdom of Hungary. And uh, yeah, you know, he tried doing business there and, uh, you know, you know, diplomatic uh, missions, I guess. Uh, like I said, I'm sure he stopped at home, probably Florence. Um, but yeah, he definitely uh, seen a lot of campaigns against Venice here. And Venice were the other, you know, big kids of the block. They were big sea power. They owned a lot, a lot of turf. Not just in Italy, but like throughout the Mediterranean. Uh, they're more like bullies, actually, Venice. If you read about them, a lot of the things are like, what? You know, and he checked them, which is pretty impressive. Um, like I said, uh, the biggest enemy here, uh, according to here, were the Turks. And it says he uh, competed with them 18 times. Now, once again, we have to take this with a grain of salt. But if he did half that, half of 18, that's still pretty impressive. And it looks like he won mostly all of his battles. You know, uh, in fact, the only time he faltered was when he dealt with the uh, the Hussites 
from the Czech Republic. Um, uh, actually, and um, what really did him in was uh, gout. So he uh, he's had like um, you know an illness you know related to gout that pretty much uh, ended his career and his life eventually. Uh, but there was a story here where you know where he was ill, where he was taken ill on a, during a battle or leading up to a battle, and he was given out orders on a stretcher. You know, we, we hear stories like this all the time, but to imagine, that's pretty, um, yeah, it's pretty neat, actually. You know, think about it. He's on his deathbed, still telling, you know, his troops what to do, commanding troops. Uh, yeah, like, wow. Um, when he eventually did die from gout, um, like I said, he was such in favor from the Hungarian nobles and the kings. He was buried in, uh, I believe, a uh, basilica like a chapel that housed other, you know, kings and noble people of uh, Hungary. Um, oh, he, um, in his life, too, he, you know, aside from being a merchant uh, from Italy and all that stuff, uh, he would hunt. Guy was a hunter. Owned a lot of castles. So mostly, like, it seems like the places that he, you know, won battles at, especially in Eastern Europe, he would, you know, manage, I guess, different... Um, towns in these, uh, you know, uh, parts of cities in Eastern Europe, and he would hunt as a pastime, and he appreciated the arts, apparently, so I guess you could call him a Renaissance man, I don't know, but, um, uh, yeah, like I said, if, if half these battles and things he did, if uh, any of it's true, half of it's true, he's, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the guy is something to talk about. And, um, yeah, like I said, he was, uh, uh, uh an Italian, um, fighting for the Hungarians. And, uh, like, you, you, you see this a lot. You see it, especially in Soldier of Fortunes. They eventually simulate, you know, with their employer, you know, the nation they work for. Uh, I mean, I'm sure, like I said, he, he went back and forth to Italy, so I'm sure he was still kind of patriotic in his own way, but, um, yeah, he, uh, had a very long career, it was super impressive, and, uh, that's him in a nutshell, pretty much, um, someone you probably wouldn't hear on the History Channel, I guess, or maybe online, I don't know, I didn't really look up a video, maybe there's, like, a whole video that, that does a way better job than I do, I personally haven't seen it, so that's why I'm doing him, uh, you know, try to do him justice here. Um, but yeah, that's really all I got to say about him. Uh, you know, he was born, uh, looks like 1368, 1369, and he wound up passing away <clears throat> in 1426. And, uh, yeah. Pretty amazing career, you know? Like I said, if there's just an ounce of truth to this guy's extensive, you know, works and his, you know, body of life. He's right up there with, you know, the Caesars. Maybe not up there, up there, but, you know, all the top mercenaries. Um, Vlad Dracula, all those guys. He's definitely, you know, one of those guys to probably, you know, mention. You know, or like a runner-up. Practically being unknown to you and to me. I'm just learning about him myself. That's why I wanted to talk to you guys about him. But yeah, the you know, career was pretty awesome. And uh, I just wanted to kind of share it with you guys. So I hope you learned something new. But yeah, um, that's him in a nutshell, like I said. There's really nothing else to add. Um, but Pio Hispano. I'll leave a, you know, a, um, like a link, you know, uh, to both guys I mentioned, actually. The guy I talked to before and this guy. In case you want to, you know, search yourself. A look at their careers uh but yeah thanks for listening you know thanks for hearing me rant um holidays are coming up uh whether you celebrate christmas or not whatever it gets you through the holidays i hope you guys are well and uh enjoy yourselves enjoy your families um just have a good time try and stay healthy and uh have a great new year's and let's hope for 
a better year after this, you know. Highly unlikely. Maybe not. I don't know. I can't predict the future. But let's kind of, uh, you know, raise our spirits to, you know, maybe, you know, get some clarity. Uh, you know, someone uh, asked me, you know, why, why history? Why do I favor history? And really, it's the simplicity of it. I'm not saying history, um, people that lived in, you know, uh, medieval times, renaissance times, uh, had it easy. Probably far from it. Um, <clears throat> but just the, the, the lifestyle, maybe, of the average commoner or prince or whatever, it just, you know, didn't seem as hectic. I mean, obviously, you live day by day. As a, you know, opposed to trying to predict, you know, we have a lot of, um, you know, uh, educated guessing today. You know, we use our smartphones for everything. And I mean, well, if, I mean, if you grew up in the 90s and 80s, you didn't have a phone like that. So, you know, you had to come up with other stuff to entertain yourself. But think about it. I mean, medieval times, renaissance times, it was a whole different ball game, And just to um, enjoy life like they used to and be in touch with yourself um you know i think it's something we're lacking today and uh by studying people like this or just whatever it is that you like from the past i say go for it check it out yourself it might be enlightening who knows all right guys um <clears throat> uh that's all i gotta mention and say and until next time stay safe stay healthy all right peace